Yeah, so the plan had been for Helmut to do a discussion, but that's been shifted to Wednesday um, because the organizers felt like we should make sure that everyone is on the same page from last week so that people aren't just not getting anything out of this week of polyfolds. Um, so the main point of this is to take questions from you guys, but I thought that I'd start off by recalling for you the definition of polyfold fretfulness mostly as a way of putting a dictionary on the board between some polyfolds concepts and classical concepts. Okay. So here's the definition of polyfold fret wholeness. And I'll, I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll underline the polyfolds specific terminologies. So a scale infinity section F of a strong bundle Y over X um, this is over X a tame M polyfold is scale Fred Holm um, if the following conditions hold. So the first condition is um, F is regularizing. And the second condition is that it has a filled version which up to a scale plus perturbation is of the following form. Actually, more precisely, at each point it has a field version, so the field version might be actually quite different, quite different, different. Yes, thank you, Helmut. So, let's say. So at each smooth point. Gosh, okay, yes, thank you. So, at each smooth point, or nearby each smooth point. Actually, it's a German. <laughs> I was trying to give a slightly imprecise version of this theorem. I'm trying to be cultural, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> This is where you turn the way. You'll get to it. <laughs> yes. yes, you can show it back at me. I have a picture on the next slide. Okay, so, which up to a scale plus perturbation is of the following form. Okay, so our bundle is going to locally look like the following. So W is some scale Banach space. Bundle is locally trivial. So the base is R little n plus W, and the fiber is R big n plus W. And the section is supposed to be, well, it's supposed to have principal part something called G. And um, on the right board, I'll tell you what property G has to satisfy. So this is like the meat of scale Fred Um So that property is that if we look at little g, and we subtract off G at the, at the point we're centering at, And then we postcompose that with the projection down to W. Okay, so that's the W in the fiber. And then we apply it to a point V comma U. So little v lives in our little n and U lives in W. Then it's of the form U minus B of U comma V, where B is a, you can think of it as a family of contraction mappings parametrized by by uh, V, let me, sorry, let me switch the order of U and V. So V is living in this finite dimensional space, family of contraction mappings parameterized by V. Um, and specifically what I mean by that is that if 
I make any choice of m and epsilon, um, following inequality holds for v, u, and u prime close to zero. where the notion of um, close to zero can depend on the choice of m and epsilon. So uh, it's this ginormous definition, but the point of me writing it on the board is not for you to completely understand it right this second. The point is to remind you of these words, which were introduced last week. And let's see if I can get all of them. Tame and polyfold uh, regularizing. Filled, scale plus, I think that's everything. And now I'll recall for you the dictionary between those terms and um, concepts you're used to. Can I ask a yes. You don't have corners appearing here because you're placing yourself in the smooth point. Is that true? Or? Uh, this, is, uh, this is stated in the boundary list context. I, sh I should have said, let's. Ah, Yes, there is a version of this with boundary, but so we don't have too many concepts at the same time. Let's assume that there's no boundary. Uh, Nick, can I ask you about that inequality on B? You haven't B the, the element of B U B U sits inside W, right? Yes. So that, um, uh, it sits inside R N plus W. R N plus W. So then the norm should it have an M attached? Yeah. Yes, yes, it should, it should. Some quantifier attached to the epsilon, I mean, you really mean for every single epsilon it's going to be, as for epsilon every, goes to zero? Yeah. Yes, but this will be true on smaller and smaller neighborhoods of zero. It will be true on smaller and smaller neighborhoods of zero. Okay. It's sort of, when you have this uh, scale structure, then you, when you go higher up, it, it just takes you know, smaller and smaller neighborhoods. So it's really a, some kind of a germ condition. <coughs> I see. So the closeness is allowed to depend on epsilon and n. Yes. Yeah, otherwise it's definitely wrong. I mean, yeah, well, that's what I was Otherwise there's about. no application for this. I was trying so. to understand what it said. Yeah, and um, if there's time at the end, I, will, I can motivate this because there's a similar property satisfied by classical Fred Hole maps. And in that context, you can think of B as something <coughs> whose differential vanishes. And that's why, in that case, this inequality is satisfied, though on small balls where the smallness depends on epsilon. Yeah, it's, I think that's what it's going to explain is if you have classical freedom theory, you could give an alternative definition. And if you take this, you see that that has to be a definition. Yes. Um, OK, before I move on to the dictionary, any other questions about this statement or complaints? OK, great. Dictionary. All right, so here's um, the scale setting, and here's the classical version. So the first word is SC plus. When you see SC plus, or more generally, when you see SCK, you should think of C infinity and CK. Um, when you see the word strong bundle, you should think of a bundle where the notion of compact perturbation makes sense. Um, yeah. let, let me not put tame into this dictionary. When you see m polyfold, you should think of a Bonnach manifold, not a not a orbifold in any way. Okay. Um, when you see 
SC plus C, you should think of a compact perturbation. And the only thing I left off is filled, because it, it's not exactly a cl classical notion. Um, let me recall for you that what does filled mean? Well, a priori, this section F isn't defined on an open subset of a scale bonic space. It's defined on a retract sitting inside such a thing, which is a, you know, not such a nice space as far as we're used to thinking of spaces. The dimension can vary locally and so forth. And therefore, in order to have a meaningful Fredholm theory, you have to beef it up to a map that actually goes between open subsets of scale Banach spaces. And that's what this filled section is. It really, yes, question? Oh, no. Oh, yes, I should, should put that in here. Regularizing means you should think of elliptic regularity. So if our section comes from the Del Bar operator, the regularizing property comes from elliptic regularity satisfied by that Del Bar operator. Um, Could you say something about him? If you don't want to put him in the picture now. Uh, so you can say something, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know if I remember the second condition of tameness, but the first condition of tameness says that, um, so you look at your retraction. Um, let's say that. R, which goes from x to x, is scale infinity and it's a retraction, then um, the first condition of tameness is that the degeneracy index of R of x is equal to the degeneracy index of x for all x and big X. So, I don't want to really get into this because I think it's a little bit more technical than the rest of the stuff on the board. It, have I stated that first condition correctly? And what's the second condition? That at a point, the retract, the tangent space, at a smooth point, the retract, the tangent space has a complement in the reduced tangent space of the cone, which actually, in this case, actually, if there's no boundary, everything is tame. Okay. Yeah, right, yes, yeah. So at the last minute, I changed this theorem to the boundary list setting, and therefore I could have erased the tameness hypothesis. Um, yeah, it's sort of it's really, when you have a retract and you have a boundary of the ambient space, you could have a lot of retracts which don't show you the typical thing of the, the boundary structure that lies stupidly. So you want to have them that they show somewhat that there was actually a boundary, this corners and so on. So you have to force it. So for example, when you, have a, when you have a quadrant and you take out the diagonal, it's not a tame retract. Because when you retract on it, near zero you have some problems. You have to retract at some point that is violated. Okay, so the, the condition, or the picture you're thinking of is that, um, that this is your C. It just takes the diagonal. So if you retract there, so near zero, I think, I mean, near zero, you have to leave. I mean, if you take a neighbor, an open neighborhood around zero, then it contains points where you, I mean, if you look at the stair, then you have to violate this. Right, so the point is that uh, if you look at this point right here, then the degeneracy index of the retract is one, but the degeneracy index in the ambient space C is two, I think. Right. Yes, so, yeah. so, but then nevertheless, this line has an induced structure, which is tame, but it doesn't come from the ambient structure. Okay, so I suggest that we leave it there. Um, great, so you're welcome. Um, so we have this uh, dictionary just to bring everyone back to speed. Um, and the last thing that I want to say before I, I move on to whatever questions you have is that um, the most basic reason, I mean, the real reason for using this wonky definition of Fredholmness is that in the classical setting, 
the reason that all of the theorems you're used to from finite dimensions are stated in the Banach setting for Fredholm maps is that they satisfy um, this, this contraction normal form. And therefore, things like the inverse function theorem hold. Um, you want to use that in a polyfold setting, but there's some problems with the levels. So that if you just assume that your linearized operators are all Fredholm, those theorems that you want to be true, like the implicit function theorem, would not be true. And therefore, we build this directly into the definition. Like I said, I'll come back to this at the end if we have time. But I want to stop talking about this Fred Holmes property now. Can I ask another question? I think I think Musa asked it already, but I can get uh, when you say close to zero, you mean that there is a fixed open set which doesn't depend on the level or it, it does depend on the level. So for every M and Epsilon there's an open set so that this inequality holds on that open set. Because if it didn't depend on epsilon, then you could put a zero in there. I mean, if it was the same set and, uh, and it was fixed, uh, and okay. it was true for all epsilon, then you could then it would have to be done. So clearly it has to depend on epsilon. Sure. Yeah. OK. Um, so let me open up the floor for questions, which I will either answer or deflect. Yeah, so I think that, okay, it's not a question or a comment. So, um, so this this means that uh, if, if you so besides being regularized, your Fredholm sections cannot make two rapid moves locally. It's a regularization property which constrains it how it moves. Whereas if you have a general SC smooth section, where first of all for this SC smooth section, the the linearization usually does not depend continuously as an operator at the point where you take the linearization. So that's one of the features. Like when you are near nodes or near uh, broken orbits, there's something rapidly uh, changing which makes the linearized operators usually not continuous as operators. <coughs> so, so the linearizations then can be very moving depending which direction they go very rapidly. And that kills the implicit function theorem in general unless you have a taming device saying it has a little bit more regularity, which is this one. So you have a, this is a germ condition in, in this uh, SC world, yeah? And so if you have this germ condition, then it turns out you have an implicit function theorem in the usual way. If you linearize and it's onto, then nearby you have a solution manifold. Which, so that means you have nearby the solution space, which actually from the ambient space gets a structure which turns it in, into an other smooth manifold. Can we actually um, have that written down? Just uh, what, yes. what the implicit function theorem says that would be. Yeah, useful. sure. Presumably, first <laughs> operators have indices, an index, right? And so Presumably, yes, that's right. right. Whoops, I should. Oh, gosh. Um, All right, so if you want to make some money, challenge me to shuffleboard this week. Um, right, so here's the implicit function theorem in the polyfold setting. OK, so let's say um, let's say that y over x is a tame strong bundle. And let me just point out before Helmut does that this is the boundary list setting, but for some reason you put the word tame there. So that was a cut and paste. <laughs> All right, so it's a tame strong bundle. It's a, it's a strong bundle over x and m polyfold with no boundary. OK. And f is a scale Fred Holmes section. Um, with the property that all of the linearizations are onto. So such that 
for every x in the zero set. No, no, you only need it at one point. Then you, ah, okay, so the diff, ah, okay, so you want to give the, oh, the, global. Okay, so you want to give the global version. Yeah, so what about you give the version of the point of the solution, f of x equals zero, either one. Okay, I can attempt to. You can correct me. So um, let's see. So let's say that set such that um, at this particular point x naught, the linearization is surjective. So d f at the point. It's just a second. So this is supposed to go from the tangent space at x to the fiber over, or excuse me, the fiber over x naught. OK, so then the theorem is that um, there's going to exist an open set. Here's where I might make a mistake with topology. So there exists u an open set in, let's say, the zeroth level of x containing x naught with the property that if we look at the zero set of f intersected with this open set, we get a finite dimensional sub m polyfold. And then it's a theorem in HWZ's papers that it automatically inherits the structure of a finite dimensional C infinity manifold. So it's a little bit stronger than sub m polyfold. So. so it's a sub m polyfold which is so good that it also has a C infinity structure. Uh, is x node a smooth point? Yeah, it's yeah by the by the regularizing property, it's a smooth point because it maps to zero. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So you're saying that? Yeah. So it's actually so the sub n polyfold is actually a rather strong retract, and then so but it's correct. So if you just say it together, it's a sub n polyfold which, in addition, has this, an equivalent structure on smooth mm -hmm. manifold. That's good, and and the linearization that any other solution set is also onto in that neighborhood. Yes, which is how you're going to prove that it's... That is, so it's an open condition that it's... Yeah, so, so there's a small open neighborhood that, that there's a full solution set carries the structure of a smooth manifold in the classical sense, and the linearization that every solution is that you is surjective as well. Yeah, so let, let me add on that point. So, um, so it's basically what we would expect from the implicit function. Right. Such that. And... For all other x in uh, u intersect the solution set, f prime at x is on two. Oh yeah, this here is a good exercise which you can write down for everybody here. So if you have a retraction from u to u, which is s is smooth from u into uh, index lifted by one, then the image has a natural smooth manifold structure. Okay. Uh, so, just to give you some idea, so if you find a good proof for this, I would be interested. So I only remember when Buchs Frauenfeld wanted to prove it. He at some point started to throw stuff around, and Peter Albers had to stop him. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just the implicit function, some implicit, some honest implicit functions. So tell me if this is what you just said. So if yeah, so R is a retraction, but as a map from U into U upper one, it's S C infinity. But U is sitting inside some scale bound so, space here? Yeah, so, yeah. so, so U you, is in E. Yeah, so 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 just okay, so let, let's let's say we have a retraction <laughs> here as usual. And, and I told you to not let him get to the chalk. <laughs> <laughs> and, and R from U into U1 is S C infinity as well. Isn't that the original statement? No, okay, so it's, it's a little bit strange. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yes, I'm sorry to say, but I think it's clear because I made 22 statements. So, 
This is a weak trend. Everybody understands this. Huh? <laughs> but if you lift the index by one, it, it means you go into the more regular space. It's still S infinity, so that's a strong condition. Then R of U is a C manifold in a natural way, induced from the ambient space. <coughs> that's a nice exercise. And, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, Dusa, does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, that's and, very helpful. And, and the proof is actually to construct such an R such that F composed with R is zero. And the, tangents, and the tangent map of R maps at each point onto the kernel of F prime. So you have to construct an F, you said construct an R. No. R is given. Construct yeah. an no, F, no, no, no. So Given F. Now we go back to the implicit functions. Oh, the proof of the implicit functions. Yeah, so the, okay. Im the image of the, what we actually construct is that the image uh, of this R is precisely the solution set. So you're saying that the idea of the proof of the implicit function theorem here is, is use the exercise. So construct such an R. So that F composed with R is zero, and that the tangent of R has precisely the kernel of F prime at that point as the image. So, so the image of the tangent of R is equal to the kernel of F prime. Yeah, it's a different process. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I have a question about yes. the construction. So can I think of this as implying various ordinary gluing theorems that we know, like, like if I have a configuration of homomorphic spheres where I can I can verify some transversality conditions, and I don't want to read that chapter of Dusan Dietmar's book, yes, I just apply this theorem. Yes, so when you set up this, uh, so in the previous week we had this discussion how to glue at nodes and so on. So if you set this up, you would get, say, the retract x. So we have a noted sphere, we look at what, what's nearby, we get the retract x, we construct this bundle, and then we look at this uh, Kusch-Riemann section, and then in the nice case where the linearization is surjective, yeah. then you have this implicit function theory and the nearby solution are the dual solution. So what's, what's the precise uh, transversality condition that needs to be verified? So in this case, of a broken thing would be actually for each bit the classical surjective. Mm -hmm. So if you have two so, spheres as so a node. Think, I think what I remember in their book says a little bit more. I think there's also a, a condition of transversality of evaluation mass. Yeah, okay. yeah okay. So, well, you need, you need the right index that that actually works. I'm sure you need well, the same conditions. It's yeah. just that but, but, but and, and you have to check them in a part of it. You have to check your fred on I mean, fred on operator. It's precise as a condition of what you said. That is what guarantees the same thing. So one can just translate that into. No, no, sure. I mean, but whatever classically is true is, is true. Uh, whatever good thing you can say classically, you find here as well. And it has the same ramifications. So how m I didn't understand what you said about how the transversality of the evaluation map in that case would get built into? Well, you, you, when you set up, uh, the things are, so, the two operators don't move independently because they have to, they're, they're defined on spheres which have common points. So that gives you some that gives you some algebraic obstruction, so you have to verify then that, that is surjective. So that is, if you have transversality of things across terms are precise and so on. So that's going to change the scale Banach spaces that you're working with, right? The condition that your nodal point has to be in common between the... No, that is in the setup. So just... Uh, uh, Can I try that to is explain? That is precisely this... Cut in, so precisely, <laughs> which I think you explained, or Joel, uh, where that is why you have the negative glue in this averaging term. Yes, right. Yeah. So in this case, this is precisely where you have maps from two spheres with two <laughs> distinguished points and the nodal value coincides. That, that is already built in that they actually coincide there. So because of this term, it, so you, you cannot look at the two operators completely separately because you have this constraint that, that the linear is, when you linearize that you only look at things which coincide over this point. So 
And that transversality condition precisely then means that it doesn't matter. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, if Chris understands the answer, I don't need to add. I'd be happy to hear what, whatever you are about to say. Okay. So <laughs> I wrote, wrote down sort of the putative filled Fred Holm section in the Fleur case. And you might remember that it was just sort of d bar, d bar in both components. Right, so in that case, you really just, you know, it's, it's a Cartesian product of two classical Fredholm operators. Those both are transverse units. Because in the Fleur setting, you don't have to worry about the answer. Yes, so right, so that's a real product. Yeah. In, the, in this Fleur setting, however, I already assumed that, but I, I didn't yeah. tell you, but I was implicitly assuming that the Hamiltonian trajectories are cut out transversely. Right. So if you now did the, the same shenanigan in a more spot situation, for example, for Grom of Witten, then the pre-gluing map, right, even the chart map for the ambient polyfold is not just defined on the product of maps from spheres, but on the fiber product where you have to take the variation maps at the nodes. And so this fiber product is going to sort of go all the way through to what your debar, what, what your filled section then is. So you can either put that fiber product into your operator or into your domain. You can pick, but essentially, you know, exactly what Helmut says come out. But it's sort of it's clearly to see already from the pre-glowing construction that you have to require equality at the node and so if you went through my whole setup you would get the two operators d bar and d bar but not on the Cartesian product only on the pairs in the Cartesian product which have the same value at the node right. so that's the thing that will need to be transferred or alternatively you would say okay I take the what is it this to, or you could also say, let's say the big moduli is equivalent to the big moduli space being cut out, or the pair being cut out transversely, and then from the pair of moduli spaces, the evaluation map to the nodal thing needs to be, or the evaluation map needs to be transverse to the diagonal. Which is exactly the classical. Right. Okay, so I strongly suspect that someone besides Helmut, Chris, and Katrin has some basic confusion from last week. So I, I <laughs> want to encourage questions like that. Um, anyone? So what about the dimension now? In that setting, oh. the, the dimension is yes. the curve. Good question. Um, right, so that's correct. Um, and um, this is going to sound trivial, but nonetheless, I think it's useful to note that if you, um, let's say that we start out with a, whoops, man, this chalk. We start out with a scale Fred Holm section F, which we don't assume to be um, surjective anywhere, um, then um, it's a theorem that the filled section, so the filled section means put together F with the um, isomorphism that you assume you have between the, the sort of complement of the retract cutting out X and that of Y. So then we get this filled section. Uh, let me call it capital F. Um, So then it's a, it's a fact that this filled section, which is now going between honest scale Bonnach spaces or open subsets thereof, has classically Fredholm linearizations. Yeah, isn't, no? Classically? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, thank you. But, but, right, yeah. Scale Fredholm linearizations. at every x in x infinity, and then Helmut, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Fredholm index of, well, but it has a Fredholm index, okay. Um, 
And let's say that the index of this linearization at some point x0 is equal to you know, i, then, um, then you can first apply uh, a theorem saying that you can always perturb using scale plus sections to get this transversality satisfied at this point. Um, so such that I think I might be mingling this, so so hold on for a second. Don't like a safer, so usually when you talk about a field section, it comes from having chosen a point for fx. So there's usually one, because when you look at this condition there, when you go higher and higher up, the points where it can only be defined, the field section basically only exists, you go to higher and higher levels, near the original chosen point. You're complaining about the... Yeah, so the fact that I should have been clear about the localness yeah, 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 of the filling. You said for every, every x. Yeah, so the because usually it makes only sense at one point. Yeah. So the, the thing that I wanted to get across, and clearly I'm not saying this correctly, is that there's there's a notion. Thank you, Helmut. There's a notion of Fredholm index, and you know even if you don't assume surjectivity, and you can perturb to get surjectivity, and then the dimension of the finite dimensional C infinity manifold that that will cut out is equal to the Fredholm index of the original thing. So rather than try to make that precise, let me just erase this. So I think what Howard is saying at this field section, you fix the x in x infinity first, and then yeah. you look then at field sections. Because, and because, and because by the theory, <laughs> every point might have a completely different, a priori could have a completely different field. Right, so, so. Um, so it's just the order of yeah, so the Think of a really wild set, and at each point, when you have to fill, you have to put something else. So, so the filling is actually only of auxiliary na nature. It doesn't, it doesn't have any intrinsic structure. It just exists, and that's it. If it exists, then it's fragile. If it doesn't, <coughs> and the nice, of course, it looks like a complicated definition. But the, the the nice thing is in applications. Once you see one example, I think all the answers follow. It's 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 almost almost canonical in applications what, what the filler actually is. It's usually the Hessian at a node. Of the, so the linearized operator at the node or at a periodic orbit or so. So it's usually standard stuff. Right. So the idea being that, like, like I mentioned on Friday, if you're studying Fleur cylinders or something, the asymptotic operator, if you look at your, your operator and you take the limit as you go off to plus or minus infinity, that asymptotic thing is going to be an isomorphism. Um, and that's what you use to define the, the filler. But the fill is defined on the whole of this infinite cylinder that you sort of lost when you when you did it. So it's a negative defined on the cylinder coming from the negative. Yeah. It's right. actually not in general not the standard cylinder. So it, if you if you look very precisely, this cylinder which you take depend on the groom yeah. Namely, they are, they are because the identification depends yeah, on the balloon frame. You, yeah. you, you slide them over and further and further. It always looks like a cylinder, but it's right. not canonical. But you've actually cut out depending on that, right? I mean, you're just saying that there's sort of canonical choices of coordinates, but those coordinates depend on what your gluing parameter is. It's yeah, there are actually two choices of, for each cylinder, two choices of canonical coordinates, which depend on the gluing parameter. Right. OK, so any, any more questions? Yeah. Yes. So that's in applications clear that uh, this property of G is satisfied with this, this form, or is that something you can... Well, my understanding is that the easiest or most natural way to prove it in applications is to use this alternate definition that um, Katrin came up with. So she came up with this definition, which sort of looks more complicated, but in fact is easier to use. But I'm not the expert on this stuff. Do you two care to comment? Is that correct? Well, I saw all Katrin's ultimates again. But Maybe has a little bit easier. Yeah, so far. I would say so, it's so the, the obvious is, way to prove these things is yeah, to okay. use the so, fact that they're smooth in all directions other than gluing parameters. And then you. And some uniformity of these derivatives in, all, in the good directions with respect to the bad directions. 
So that is that what I mean. So it's not so. It's it's actually not that difficult. I mean, I think uh, to put in this framework is sort of on the level of proving some growing theorem in a simple situation, and like two caps or something or two spheres. What Caption is saying when she says that differentiation is. I think that the key of what Katrin said is that when we're looking at this reparameterization action, um, it was not differentiable, but it was not differentiable exactly because of what was going on with the gluing parameter. So you could differentiate in the function direction as much as you wanted, um, but the bad stuff was happening in the gluing parameter direction. Yeah, but the yes. reparameterization is bad in all directions. So, I mean, if you slide the. Yeah. But I mean, if you fix the gluing parameter, then yeah, it's... Okay. Yeah, but the thing is, in the, when you look... Yeah, of course, it, it has something to do with the domain, but when you look at the, when you look at the change of coordinates, it's usually by a different physics, depending on the gluing parameter. So, so the gluing parameter enters over a family of different on the domain. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so. Okay, so... Maybe it's the same. My impression was that philosophically that was built directly into Katrin's equivalent definition of Fredholmness, this thing I just said about the reparameterization action, but not quite sure. Um, and there's a really great write-up of the proof of polyfold Fredholmness of the Delbar operator in the Hamiltonian Fleur case in a paper of Katrin's on the archive, uh, don't remember the title, but it was 2012. Is Ketron's alternate definition for splicings only or for retractions? I think it's for splicings only. The definition is... Here, your equivalent definition that The holds equivalent for definition is for maps between what? open subsets of scale bound out spaces. Uh, Once they're filled, so... And so, okay. I then yeah. just, I don't sure. explain the filling, right. I just write down the filled version in yeah. that paper. Okay. Do you expect any applications where you actually need uh, retractions and not just splices. I think that the answer is no. Why? Well, what's an example? How do you, can you, how do you predict the future? Yeah, expect. In all current applications, my understanding is that splicing is necessary. I don't think any are known at the moment for which yes, retractions how, are going to be necessary. In mathematics, predicting the future, I find really bad. <laughs> it's usually wrong. I but, stopped doing this. But anyway, in... Before this argument, what's the difference between a splicing and a retraction? Okay. Good question. Great. Right. So... So first, retraction. So... A scale retraction... Um, is a scale infinity map R, which goes between open subsets of scale Banach spaces with R composed R is equal to R. Okay, so scale retraction, that's it, and it has this really simple definition. The definition of um, splicing is takes slightly longer to write down, um, but it's a special case of scale retraction. So a scale splicing um, is a map following form. So let's call it P going from and let me write down the case without boundary. Rd plus e to itself of the following form. So it's going to send a point v comma v comma e to v comma um, pi sub v of e. Um, with the following properties. So the, the first thing is that these pi sub v's are families of, uh, of linear retractions. So for all v, pi sub v, which goes from e to itself, 
is a, um, let's see, is a, what do you want to call it, a scale projection. Uh, yeah, so let me just say, so, so it's a, Linear scale zero map from e to itself, which squares to itself. And then the second property is that p itself is smooth. Did I said that correctly. Yeah. Okay. So, um, right. So. That's not depends mostly on. That's right. So it's not even continuous. That's the whole point. Hmm? Not standard smoothly. It's SC smoothly. But well, it's it's smooth in the sense that when you put them all together, capital P is SC smooth. But I think your question was, if you look at these operators, yeah, it, it's not even going to be continuous as a map from R D to L of E comma E. By, by the way, Joe reminded me that there are splice, that there are retractions which are not splicings coming up. Good applications. Which application? Like construct the manifold of maps from one manifold into the other. You can can construct that basically in, in sixty seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. so maybe maybe that's good for uh, Wednesday. All right, yeah, that's your hour, Helmut. Um, right, so, um, and let me just remind you that there's this example that we went through on Wednesday. Sorry, uh, just before you write the uh, is it that the word linear is the crucial thing that distinguishes the splicing from the retractions? I would say that V is the first component is the crucial. I mean, both of them. So it, it, it's a family of linear projections, whereas this R a priori, like you have no idea what kind of form it has. Um, yeah, there, there's not this RD that's going to split off of U that parameterizes some kind of family of maps, even nonlinear ones. Is, is the splicing automatically tame? Yes. Or do you... yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think, I haven't double checked this, but I think it's uh, the crucial element is the fact that the, the first component is V. It's sort of an identity. That like what, because because v here in this case is kind of acting like a boundary defining function and it's not mixed in with the rest of what's going on and so when you can when you can when you can we can kind of separate it out i think that is the essential feature which guarantees sort of tameness and a lot of these other properties which uh which follow from for splicing is relatively easy and not necessarily for attraction so easily because the boundary is all seen in other rd you, you take some yes, yeah, that's the only thing so the boundary is there is, and, is, and, and everything is nice exactly that's why i would think so let me recall for you that this example that I talked about last Wednesday, um, where the retraction was homeomorphic to this set inside of R2, is an example of a splicing. So in this case, um, V is running in the horizontal direction. Uh, and for any positive V, the projection pi sub V is projecting onto a bump function or projecting onto the one dimensional subspace spanned by a bump function centered at e to the one over V. For V less than or equal to zero, pi sub V is zero. Um, and as was alluded to, every single retraction that has come up when constructing modulus spaces of diholomorphic curves has been a scale splicing. So the, um, the big one is <clears throat> when you're projecting onto the kernel of anti-gluing, that's, uh, that's going to give you a scale splicing. So whoever asked that, are, are you happy now? Yeah. Okay. Well, like when you said this, I remembered, but you know. But you might need a retraction that's not a splicing at some point. In theory, yeah. Um, I guess that Joel actually has an example that he just recall recalled um, when you're constructing a manifold of maps. But me? No. Oh, that that uh, there might be a scenario. Apparently, they have a scenario where 
you need to consider rejections and that's not a splice of okay. Need is a strong word, but very useful. And the example as well? Will be uh, sh uh, uh, shown on Wednesday. Uh, think about the following, how things are different. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so if you, if you look at the differential geometry, then you have a li little bit harder time already to find some book which actually talks about manifold with boundaries. But if you then want to look at somebody talking about manifold with boundary and corners, I think it's basically impossible to find such. And why is it? Because the author, though, before, without boundary, they talk about sub-manifolds, which are of course important. But if you come, come now to boundary and corners, and you want to talk about sub-manifolds, it gets a little bit of a zoo, yeah? what you can say. Now, here, if you just define a sub-manifold, this classical differentiability, as a set which is locally a retraction, then, then in the interior it will be a real manifold, and near the boundary you have a tangent space to the set, and, if, and you can say more about the boundary behavior if you know how the tangent space lies with respect to the rest. So my proposal is, in differential geometry books, so you should actually build everything on retracts. Because it's just an absolutely easy formalism, much faster construction of manifold of maps goes like degrees, everything. So that's my proposal to get on the Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, right, so I think one more question, then I want to say something. What's that? Can you say, you wanted to say something about the classical level of the Fredholm condition? How it looks like in the last Yeah, so I think I have something more important to say. If you want to read about that, it's like half a page long, it's um, super easy, and it's nice, and it's in a paper titled A General Fredholm Theory Number no. Two by Hofer Vysotsky and Sender in the introduction. Any other last question? Okay, so what I want to do in the, in the last 10 minutes, I hope I can fit it in, is, um, is, is prove a, like, the easiest possible version of regularization theorem. And the reason that this is relevant is that the polyfold version of this has exactly the same proof, basically with scales stuck in front of some words. Um, right, and I should say that this is lifted from Caption's course a couple of years ago. Um, right, so here's the idea. So let's take a finite dimensional vector bundle, E living over B, and S is a section of it. So here, B is a finite dimensional manifold, E is a finite rank vector bundle. Um, S is a C infinity section, and the zero set is compact, which turns out to be crucial to the proof of this theorem. So what's the theorem say? It says that you have, um, you have perturbations. So conclusion is there exists a set called P sitting inside of the compactly supported um, right C infinity sections with the following properties. So, okay. Um, the first one is, is saying that there are, there are elements of P and they, in fact, you can find arbitrarily small elements of it. So there exists a sequence P sub I um, such that P I goes to zero in C infinity loc. Okay. The next one is transversality. So that's, that's pretty important. So for every P in, in this curly P. Um, uh, if we perturb S by P, then that thing intersects the zero set transversely, which is to say that for every B in the zero set, the linearization is on to. So dB of S plus P is onto as a map from the tangent space of B at little b to the fiber. Does this grammatically say that pi goes to zero? Yeah, yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and then the last one is that compactness is preserved. Yeah, so the proof is short and it's pleasant. And like I said, if you know the proof of this theorem, then you also know how to prove it for polyfolds, essentially. Okay. 
So let's fix B naught in the in the solution set. So um, while our solution isn't necessarily transverse to that point, we knew that the we know that the co-kernel of the linearization is finite dimensional since E is finite rank. So then let's choose a basis. E1 through EM for the co-kernel of the linearization at B naught of S. Okay. Um, then let's extend these guys to compactly supported sections. Okay. Uh, and so then using these finitely many sections, let's soup up our original vector bundle. So let's look at um, the following thing sitting over B times Rm. So the projection is the obvious projection. And now we get this new section called S tilde. And it's defined by setting S tilde applied to B, X1 through XK is defined to be um, S at B da, 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 plus X1, T1 at B through XM, TM at B. OK, and then we're just, of course, doing the trivial thing in the R direction. Now, the point of this is that now we've killed off that co-kernel at B naught. <laughs> so we know that S tilde is transverse to 0 at the point um, B naught 0. OK. Um, and it follows from that that there exists um, delta greater than 0, and u, which sits inside of b, which is supposed to be a neighborhood of b naught, with the property that um, s tilde is actually transverse to 0 on all of u times the ball of radius delta centered at 0. OK, and then the point of this is we're now going to exploit the um, compactness of the original solution set to say that we can more or less cover the original solution set by finitely many of these sets u. Okay. Any questions about this so far? OK, so let's cover B, which is compact. by finitely many of these open sets U. Since we can do this original process at any B naught in the solution set. OK, so then what that allows us to do is we can. B was not necessarily compact, but S inverse 0 is compact. S inverse of 0 is compact. Thank you, instead of being Great. So then what this allows us to do, if you write down what this implies, is construct um, a fattening up E times RK living over B times RK and a section S tilde with the property that, let me say this correctly, right. S tilde is transverse to 0 on B, or yeah, excuse me, on S inverse of 0 times the ball of radius delta. So it's now crucial that, that there were only finitely many of these sets so I could choose the uniform delta. OK, so now we're almost done. Um, so let's set sigma 
to be um, right b times b delta of zero. intersect the solution set of S tilde. Oh, and I'm sorry, this should have been, this should have been a neighborhood U of the zero set. So U is supposed to contain the zero set. So now it makes sense. Okay, so sigma, because um, the zero set of S tilde is cut out transversely on this guy here, um, sigma is gonna be a finite dimensional manifold. Yes, thank you. Okay, and now we're essentially done because we can consider what happens when we include sigma into the base and then we project down to rk. So let's call this map um, q. Um, so then we can apply Sard's theorem to Q. Note that we're in the totally, you know, finite dimensional setting. No problem with Sard's theorem. So Sard's theorem tells us that there exists um, a point, uh, let's call it Y in RK, which is as small as we like, though I won't say that. So that's what's going to allow us to prove the first part of the theorem. So this is a regular value of Q. Um, and so it follows that if we look at S plus Y1, T1, all the way up through YK, TK, this guy, which is the section now of our original bundle E over B, is transverse to zero, um, which is all we wanted in the first place. So. Anyway, that proves the theorem. Um, and um, let me tell you what you need to do to put this into the polyfold setting. So the first thing is that you need this contraction part of the definition of scale Fredholm in order to be able to say that um, you know, solution sets of things transverse to zero are finite dimensional smooth manifolds. And then the other thing that you need are, you need your scale box spaces to actually be scale Hilbert spaces in order for bump functions to be defined. Yeah, you just need, uh, yeah, you need SC smooth bump functions, but they exist also. Not all Banach spaces. But also. Okay, so anyway, you need bump functions. And besides that, uh, the rest of the theorem carries through. Any questions about the proof? And then your S, your, TIs would be SC plus objects. Yes, right. Your TIs are now going to be. Otherwise, you can just copy them. Yeah, so you're going to conclude that you can get transversality by perturbing only with scale plus sections. Yeah. Felix? You call this recognition theory, but it's nothing to do with the regularizing property of F. It's just that you can make complex perturbation. It's just. Yeah, I, I guess it's a different kind of regularizing. It's a regularizing in the sense that you end up with a smooth manifold. Yeah, it's very confusing, the language, because there's two kinds of regularization. Okay, I will stop now. I suppose we had a full hour of questions, but uh, is there any chance for some last minute ones? Yeah, could you say one word about how I get cobordisms for different perturbations? In this five case. Yeah, um, let's see, can I say anything sensible? So I haven't worked it out, but I think that you're just going to need to. So you're going to start off with these things that are transversely cut out, and you're going to basically need to extend whatever perturbations you made to get transversality into this whole cobordism. I mean, um, you just need to prove a version of this theorem where. On some closed, in the neighbor of some closed set, you already have a regular perturbation. 
Yeah. And then you want to yes. extend it as yes. a regular one. But, that, but you see immediately that that works as well. Because then in the other case, you have two boundary components, which are already regular. And then you just extend that in regular fashion. So. And it's the same idea. You just add one parameter, T, but you use the same reason. Mm -hmm. then you would be so the one thing I wonder about is the initial step when you take your perturbations and you want to extend to something which is not necessarily transverse, but you certainly at least need Fred Holm. So, so yeah, so you need, of course, if you add that parameter, this is still Fred Holm, but that is not an issue. Well, in polyform, not in five dimensions, definitely. And, and then you are already regular near the boundary because they have a two regular perturbations. Yeah. And then you have just to do this thing inside to fill up the core boundary. And then you just that means you perturb a little bit your parts, and that's it. So, so it's basically the Well, the one thing that's confusing me is certainly if, you, if, you've, ex if you've gotten this homotopy through Fred Holm operators, you'll be OK. But, uh, but is, why is that immediate that you can do that? Well, there's a well you, look at, you look at your principle here. Right? Yeah, you just add this V has one addition parameter T, which, doesn't, which isn't the fact. Oh, I see. I see. OK, right. So key is that we use this contraction form for Fred Holmness, right? I mean, it goes immediately into this. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and end there and thank Nate one more time.